A Mark IV Toyota Supra Turbo sold at the Barrett Jackson Auto Auction two years ago for $176,000. I bought a Supra Turbo 11 years ago for $15,000. Fourth generation Supra values in the US have gone up exponentially in the last decade. But why? And will regular people ever be able to afford Supras again? Let's talk about that. This is not some concept car of the future, but Toyota's very latest Supra. Future collector's car right here. Everyone knows about the legend of the fourth generation Toyota Supra. It was a Japanese sports car from the mid-90s that punched well above its weight. And it went on to become a huge icon of car culture, thanks to its immense tuning potential, and of course its casting in a certain famous street racing movie franchise. But the Supra today plays a very different role in car culture than it did in the early 2000s. Supras today are in the news for only one thing, their sale prices. The Barrett-Jackson Supra I mentioned was one of a handful of Supras that sold for over $100,000. Brand new, the most expensive Supra retailed for about 50,000 bucks or about 85 grand in today's money. So how did Supras become more valuable than their original retail price? Well, let's go back in time to when they weren't. 2001, the Supra was out of production in the US market and was winding down for good in Japan. Sales were poor in its final years as the car was just too expensive in a shrinking sports car market. By the end of production, only about 45,000 Supras were made worldwide, with just about 12,000 being sold in the United States. Then, the Fast and Furious hits theaters and car dudes go nuts. The then exploding car scene was finally getting some real recognition. And at the face of it all, the Toyota Supra. So that was it. From then on, the Supra commanded a premium for being the poster boy of tuner car culture. Well, no, not really. While many claim that Fast and Furious was the sole reason for the Supra's success, it was really only a piece of the puzzle. In 2001, you could get a low mileage turbo Supra in the US for about $25,000 to $30,000. 1997, 1998 cars commanded a bit of a premium and sold in the $35,000 range. But at that point, the cars were only a few years old, so most of them were in pretty good condition and pretty new. Few of them were modified beyond wheels and bolt-ons like exhausts and intakes. And from 2001 to about 2005, super prices dipped as depreciation did its work. Owners put more miles on them and there were cheaper and cheaper examples on the market, with non-turbo and automatic cars being even cheaper than their turbo and manual counterparts. It wasn't outlandish to find a non-turbo Supra for eight to $10,000. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering which versions of the Mark IV Supra were the most and least valuable. Well, it's not exactly straightforward, but it comes down to three things. First, there's the trim levels. There's turbo and non-turbo. Turbo's better. Manual and automatic manuals better, hardtop and target top. But this one's a little tricky. Super guys like me might say the hardtop is worth a premium. And while they are rarer, the Targa was a value added option. So really it's hard to say which would be more valuable to a collector. Second on the list is rarity. The Mark IV Supra came in a variety of colors across all its trim levels over the years. As production slowed, the 96 to 98 model saw the introduction of some very cool low volume colors like Quicksilver, Imperial Jade Mika, Deep Jewel Green, and the unofficial king of the hill, Royal Sapphire Pearl, which is often considered the most coveted Supra to have. But even then, there are just some random color combinations that are far more rare than the others. For example, if you owned a 1995 Supra Turbo six-speed manual with the hardtop, you had one of about 21 cars that existed in the US. And if it was silver, you had one of just two. Paul Walker, rest his soul, owned a white 95 Turbo six-speed hardtop, and there were only three of them. By the way, the least rare Mark IV, a 1994 automatic in black. The third and final factor that determines a Mark IV's value is the obvious, mileage and condition. The less miles and the cleaner the car, the better. This goes without saying because generally collectors aren't looking for your tube framed 3.4 liter stroker drag pig to add to their concourse collection. All that makes sense? Good. As the 2000s went on, the tuning potential of these Supras really came into full swing. And many of these cars were torn apart and turned into absolute monsters. You guys have seen them. The fire-breathing, thousand horsepower, highway cruisers, and drag strip destroyers that became a staple of street racing videos and techno-laden montages on streetfire.net. 
Here's some of my own home footage that my older brothers took back in the day. These are the kind of Supras our friends had. And at the time, this was the coolest thing that anyone had ever seen. But all these Super Supras meant that unmodified, unmolested versions of these cars became rarer and rarer. And prices began to reflect that in the late 2000s. By 2008, a 1994 turbo manual car with about 60,000 miles was fetching about $35,000, which is about what they were worth at the turn of the century. Not bad, they were going back up in value. In my research, I found some poor sap that wanted to trade his for a then new to market Trailblazer SS. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's probably not too happy about that decision. By the way, remember that Supra I bought for $15,000? Well, that was in 2010, and that was a turbo six-speed with a decent amount of mileage on it. I bought it off an engineer who worked for this very little-known California car company called Tesla. He thought electric cars were the future, and so he sold his Supra for a down payment on the revolutionary upcoming new model called the Model S. Yeah, he probably wasn't too happy about that decision either. By 2012, not much had changed. Clean, low mile turbo Supra still fetched about 35 to 40 grand, with your average turbo car running about $25,000, non turbo cars at about 15. But in 2013, things started to take a bit of a turn. Prices across the board started to creep up. First for turbo cars, then even for non-turbo cars. This was catalyzed by the fact that parts were getting harder and harder to find. At this point, the Supra was out of production for 15 years, well past the mark of Toyota discontinuing various replacement parts. Add to that the fact that Getrag, the transmission supplier for the Supra, wasn't producing parts for the legendary V160 six-speed manual. And Supra owners were busy converting horsepower into destroyed synchros on their highway race cars. This led to standalone transmission skyrocketing in price, with new inbox V160s costing well over $10,000. And in turn, turbo Supras that came with the six-speed manuals began fetching premiums in the market. All this meant that even high mileage cars were listing for $30,000 or even more. So long as they were turbo and manual, people wanted them, and they were willing to pay above market value for them. 2014 saw prices move further up, 2015 even more so. And by 2016, dealers and collectors that were holding on to low mileage examples of Supras began listing them for prices that nobody had ever seen before. 50, 60, even $70,000 for a mint condition turbo Supra. And the craziest part, they were selling. These headlining sales caused a tidal wave that took super prices across the board to places that many people thought unimaginable. By 2017, collectors started getting a little bit more defensive in this extremely bullish super market and started listing cars well into the 80s. They hoped that even if nobody bought them at those prices now, it was just a matter of time. Through 2018, the average turbo car with plenty of miles fetched eh, right around $40,000. Manual turbo cars with under 60,000 miles, those were easily a $50,000 proposition. But this was also the year that 1993 JDM Supras became 25 year legal in the United States. And so Supras began to get imported into the US from Japan. Many people, myself included, thought that this influx of supply from the Japanese market would dilute the US market and bring prices down across the board. But we were wrong. Low mileage JDM cars hit US ports and were snatched up immediately for forty dollars to $50,000. Sure, they were slightly cheaper than their USDM counterparts, but JDM sales had almost no effect on the exploding US market. And then, in January 2019, something happened that nobody was prepared for. A Supra broke the six-figure mark. A 7,000-mile 1994 twin-turbo six-speed Supra sold for $121,000. The buyer? A Toyota dealership. A little dubious perhaps, but it didn't matter. This set the precedent for super prices to get launched into the stratosphere. Just two months later, the record was broken again at an RM Sotheby's auction with an 11,000 mile 1994 turbo going for 173,600. And then one month later, a 10,000 mile 93 turbo car sold for $128,000, nearly $50,000 less than the previous car. So that was it. Super prices had peaked in March and were finally on the decline. Yes. No. 
In June of that same year, the now famous Barrett Jackson car made its way across the auction block and set the $176,000 record that still stands today. Now, that car may have been a one-off, a fluke of an auction that went far higher than it should have. It was a nearly 70,000 mile example and it wasn't even totally stock. But at this point, again, it didn't matter. The market just needed another reason to erupt. And this was it. In just one year, the average market value of a Supra went up 25%, and low mileage examples were comfortably in the $70,000 range. My own cousin sold his 1997 Deep Jewel Green Turbo 6 speed on Bring a Trailer and got $87,500 for it. How much did he pay for it, you ask? Well, in 2012, he paid $33,000 for it. Yeah. And despite a global pandemic and economic crisis, the super train just kept chugging along in 2020, with another 15,000 mile car selling for $126,000 and the average Supra selling for 60,000 plus. Even the JDM cars that were being shipped over here a couple years ago for 40 grand were now selling for $70,000 or more today. At this point in 2021, the supermarket is the highest that it's ever been, representing a nearly 300% increase over the last decade and a half. And it's only a matter of time before another barely driven Supra surfaces and breaks the $200,000 mark. So then, will regular people like you and I who don't have $100,000 to spend on a 90s Japanese car ever be able to afford a Mark IV Supra? Honestly, I don't think so. At this point in time, the least valuable version of a Supra, a non-turbo automatic from Japan, will still cost you about $30,000 depending on condition. Turbo models are double that, and prices look to only be increasing from here. On occasion, a barn find or abandoned project might come up for sale for a decent price, like our $10,000 Supra project, and they'll cost you an arm and a leg to get back on the road, with even simple interior parts being super hard to find and costing a fortune. Although, if you're okay with about 80% of the super experience and you aren't afraid to get your hands a little dirty, I'll let you in on a little secret. The Lexus SC300 is a Toyota Supra. The Z30 platform was the basis for the Mark IV Supra's platform. Take a look underneath and you'll notice it's pretty much all the same. They even came with a 2JZ just not a turbo one. But like I said, if you like getting your hands dirty, it's not too tough to turn the SC300 into a Lexus Supra. How much do you have to pay for this pseudo Supra, you ask? Well, you can find SC300s for well under $10,000. Good luck finding a Supra for anywhere near that. And now, while it's easy to say that Supras aren't worth the price that they command, and that prices have to come down at some point, the market continues to defy expectations and trend upwards. Would I buy a Supra at 70, 80, $100,000? Hell no. And I feel a little bit of sadness saying that. My brothers and I have owned 16 Supras between us over the years, and the vast majority of them have cost less than a Toyota Camry. They've always been the cars that defined our personal car culture, our gearhead experience. And while it might seem great that resale values are always in our favor, these days, we hold on to each Supra a little bit tighter. Because as we all slowly get priced out of the market, you never know if this one's gonna be your last. Thanks for watching, guys. I wanna give a big shout out to Steve Theodore and the guys at the Super Registry. Thank you guys on behalf of all Super owners everywhere. Like the video if you learned something new about Supras and subscribe if you wanna see more Gearhead content. I'll see you guys next time.